um, on policy advocacy. You can go to the next slide. This is us. I think our pictures were just up a moment ago. The next slide. Thank you. Um, just a little bit about our organization. Um, we are a public mental, a public mental health, a public health organization. We do mental health, uh, reproductive health, largely adolescent health, women's health. And um, we really try to bring that together with training and advocacy, um, policy work, direct service sometimes, lots of programming. And we've been around in New Orleans for 30 years and have some partners across the country and in a few other countries as well. Go to the next slide. So talking a little bit about how we all, I think, have come here. We were uh, we were the official grantee recipient of the Merck for Moms Safer Childbirth Cities uh, funding grant award. I think the important thing that we want to name about it is that we were the official recipient, but we applied in coalition and in partnership with two other organizations, with Birthmark Doula Collective and NBEC, National Birth Equity Collect Collaborative, which has since changed its name to the Reproductive Health Institute um, and is a national organization. And for us, that was really important because of the multiple strategies we were focusing on. We focused on a few, we had quite a few milestones we were trying to hit and we were really successful as a collaborative. And we really think it was because we brought public health and some research acumen, um, birthmark what the birth workers providing direct service. And Beck was doing national policy and working, helping us to build out our local policy and advocacy arm. And we think that that was really the, the strength of the work. These images are from our advocacy days um, at the Capitol and just kind of showing how we all work together. You can go on to the next slide. I think the other thing that I would say about it Fundamentally for us, sustainability is really about collaboration and enduring meaningful partnerships, community-led change initiatives, um, building our advocacy muscles and our uh, birth work muscles together and doing that in coalition, it feels like the, the most effective way to do it. As one organization, we can't do everything, but we really feel like to make the changes that we wanna see in the world, we have to focus on the ways we can come together and build something lasting that will not only serve our populations of that we're most focused on, but also be co-led with um, the women and birthing people in our community. Can go to the next slide. So the sustainability domains um, that I think we've all been a little bit steeped in are listed here. Um, you can go to the next slide where I just say a few words about kind of our interpretation of those. These are the same domains listed and thinking about challenges to sustainability. Um, I would just lift up a few things. You know, when we think about uh, continuous quality improvement and evaluation, really having uh, accessible data is critical, whether that is primary data that we collect ourselves or being able to access that secondary data that we need that's out there. Um, we know a lot of MCH data is um, infamously a few years behind when we actually get access to it. So we really try to create some creative pathways um, through our perinatal quality collaborative that's statewide and, and a lot of uh, healthcare institutions to, to getting more real-time data. Um, the challenges to sustainability around benefits to the community and users, I think what I wanna focus on with you all today is really why we decided to do a public awareness campaign, a You Deserve, you deserve a Doula campaign as part of our sustainability work. We realize so much good work is happening so many providers and birth workers and researchers are at the table doing lots of good things, but frequently the knowledge around how that can benefit the community at large is, is not as widely distributed as we like. Um, and organizationally, we have the good fortune of having an in-house research and evaluation team 
and an in-house communications team with that's really experienced in social marketing and public awareness campaigns and and new media creation, filmmaking, and so forth. And so we really see this as a critical niche that we want to uh, address in terms of challenges to sustainability at times, building the public awareness and public engagement in the work. Um, I don't, I'm not, yes, you can move on. I'm not sure that <clears throat> the, all the other things here, I'm sure are very universal to many of us. The one thing I do wanna lift up is Sociopolitical climate where we're doing our work is uh, a big defining part of our landscape. And that's why we have to work in strong coalition. So we really are trying to think about creative ways to build those advocacy muscles to address it. Can go on to the next slide. I think Tyler, that's you. Mm -hmm. So I'll hop in now and I'll share about uh, the campaign that we're working on. Um, and so like Lisa mentioned, we're really wanting to kind of focus in public awareness. And so we decided that we would have a doula awareness campaign. And the goal of our project is to complete a bifold public will campaign that's des designed to not only raise awareness around the benefits of having a doula support during pregnancy, but also to promote policy for Medicaid reimbursement. And so we plan to do this by developing a campaign, of course. Um, and we're wanting to kind of lean on a previously existing campaign that we had called This Is Why. And we launched it in 2020, kind of centered around um, centered around Black voices and Black pain within the healthcare system. And so it kind of had two arms. This is why we die, which is shining a light on um, kind of the systemic issues that we're experiencing. And then also, this is why we thrive. Um, to highlight, you know, these are things that help us to do well. And what we're wanting to do with this campaign is to use this kind of as a launching board to be able to expand in that this is why we thrive area and showing how when we have, um, or when, not when we, but when people have access to doula care, it can really help to improve uh, birth outcomes. So we can go to the next slide. So measuring success for us, um, as far as the campaign is concerned, we're wanting to really look at unique visitors to the This Is Why landing page when that launches and really tracking engagement through social media, through our comms analytics, and also taking a look at the number of institutional partners and sign-on supporters in the community at large, and also the level of support among policymakers and within MCOs to continue expanding access to doula care in our community. So this builds on some of the previous work that we did with the initial round of funding and the Mama Plus agenda that we have here um, in Louisiana. And we were able to get uh, public and private insurance coverage for doulas, um, for doula services. And so what we're wanting to do now is to really bolster that and get the word out. So people that are aware of what's going on and then also looking at how um, looking at how how the rollout is going and how we might be able to improve upon what we've done already in this area. I'm sorry, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> so what we're hoping to see after this project is an increase in access to and uptake of doula services. Um, and also increased community advocacy for MCH issues supported by the Mama Plus Health Policy Agenda and increased support for services for birthing people insured by Medicaid as majority of the births in the state are covered by Medicaid and also an increased awareness around the benefits of doula services. So when we first started, we hosted two listening sessions with people in the community that either birth with a doula or without a doula, just wanting to get an understanding of, you know, how did you find your doula? What do you know about a doula? Have you ever even seen a campaign like this? And what we learned was that it's largely kind of word of mouth um, and that they had never really experienced something like what we're doing. So it's it feels like this is really poised to be successful in the community and some things that we learned um, were that people do really kind of rely on social media for where they're getting their information from and trusted, um, uh, and trusted experts in the field. And so we're hoping that our campaign will be a way for people to not only learn about 
the, the services that they can get from doulas, but also how, um, but also how policy is informing, you know, the access that they can have to it. And we can go to the next slide. So in conclusion, um, Lisa kind of spoke on this before when she was sharing about some of the challenges to sustainability, but a lot of external factors are kind of involved with how we're able to continue doing this work. So, you know, our continued partnership with other organizations that are in reproductive and birth justice and also public health research and direct service provision and also the political climate that we work in. Um, has an impact on you know how we're able to sustain the work that we're doing um as a lot of our success sort of hinges on our ability to be able to advocate for policy change and being able to work within the environment that we're existing in and, and so some things that would accelerate our success would be more funding for meaningful collaboration on complex policy and advocacy issues and also the support of creative methodologies that really center narrative change and community-defined community evidence. And thank you so much for listening to our presentation. <laughs> thank you, Lisa and Tyler. Um, we are going to introduce our next presenters, if you just give me a second. Uh, Michelle and Erica from Camden Coalition. So first, Michelle is a senior clinical manager at Camden Coalition for the Care Management and Redesign Initiatives Department. Michelle is a registered nurse and has experience working with individuals with medical and social complexities to identify barriers to care and assist in developing patient-centered care plans to support reaching personal wellness goals. Much of her work has been specifically focused on maternal health, substance use, and individuals involved with the child welfare and justice systems. Currently, she oversees a maternal health initiative that aims to improve timely access to pregnancy care following emergency room visits. Next, we have Erica, and Erica is a program manager also at the Camden Coalition in the Care Management and Redesign, Redesign Initiatives Department. Erica's work focuses on engaging with clinical practices and community-based organizations to improve the regional ecosystem's ability to provide authentic, patient-centered care for people with complex health and social needs. Currently, she supports the sustainability efforts for a maternal health initiative that aims to improve timely access to pregnancy care following emergency room visits. Previously, Erica worked as a community health worker doing telephonic case management for people using the emergency room with identified social determinant needs. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to them. All right, let me just pull up my slides here. Okay, I can see the slides okay? Yes. All right, awesome. Cool, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, you already got to meet us. Uh, Erica, if you just wanna say hi real quick. Um, Erica and I worked side by side on this project um, and she's on here and might jump in if I forget anything. Yep, I'm happy to be here. Hi everyone. Um, first, we'll share a little bit about uh, the Camden Coalition. Um, so our mission at the Camden Coalition, we're a nonprofit based in Camden, New Jersey, and our mission is to improve health and well-being of people with complex health and social needs uh, by, sorry, excuse me, um, by demonstrating and advancing um, equitable e ecosystems of care. We, uh, our vision is a transformed healthcare system that ensures every individual receives patient-centered care rooted in authentic healing relationships. And we have a big goal, uh, organizational goal that we're working on, which is by 2025, we're hoping to confront inequities and system failures by strengthening the ecosystems of care in 500 communities in Camden and across New Jersey and around the country. That's our big goal. We call it our BFG, our big friendly goal. Um, and so that's something that we're working toward. And you'll see uh, some of that in this presentation when we talk about our project. So um, first of all, how we uh, work to impact um, that kind of transformation that we're talking about in the uh, mission and vision of our organization 
is that when we set up our pilot programs, we try to really take a holistic approach. And so with our original grant from um, Safer Childbirth Cities, we um, took that approach of looking at prenatal care and, and looked at it as from a kind of an ecosystem um, lens. And so first we, we thought about using our experiences. We've been working in Camden for a long time, working with patients who have complex health and social needs. And we've learned a lot about um, building what we call authentic healing relationships. So part of this pilot was the aim was to um, take what we'd learned and help improve um, dynamics between patient and providers in the prenatal space. And also to expand um, how people in the clinical, um, you know, outpatient clinical world think about the um, prenatal care and kind of think about it um, beyond just the medical needs and so many more needs that people have and could be addressed through prenatal care. And so we try to push a uh, shift people toward a more proactive model of care delivery. So as um, many of you probably know, if somebody goes into the ER, there's not usually, uh, they might go into the ER, find out they're pregnant or know they're pregnant, but there's not really any um, fault, uh, help or support to help them get over to um, outpatient care, prenatal care. And so, and traditionally the healthcare system kind of waits for people to come to them. And so with this pilot, we were we wanted to try to shift that to having um, the clinical setting kind of think about being a little bit more proactive about inviting people into care and making that process a little easier. Um, we also provided a, a small patient cost budget um, to the, the sites that we worked with. I'll talk about it more in a minute. Um, and we did that also to help them kind of expand like how they could be providing more support to um, their patient population. And then lastly, um, again, we really like to think about care as an ecosystem. And um, in order to improve that ecosystem of care, we also uh, wanted to in, uh, involve multiple partners in this project and um, in, improve the way they were delivering care, but also get them connected to each other and out of um, the traditional silos that uh, often exist in the care delivery system. So what we did is we set up a workflow um, to help people get that support they need after an ER visit to help them over to prenatal care. And so what we did is we run a health information exchange for the Camden area. And if uh, you don't know what that is, that's a basically kind of takes medical records from multiple different health systems that whose medical record systems don't communicate, puts them into one place so that you can see um, what's, you know, uh, yeah, the medical record from multiple systems into one place. And so we use our health information exchange to monitor 13 ERs. And then we had a list that would filter a report, a daily report that would filter out um, or filter in only people who, um, had an indication that they were pregnant. So with that list, we then did another uh, manual review of all those records to see if they're eligible for our program. To be eligible, they had to be pregnant, have a recent pregnancy, or um, uh, and, and also not have any evidence of connection to prenatal care yet or other type of pregnancy-related care. So if they were eligible for the program, then we would assign them to one of our six outreach sites. So our we had um, we were working with three health systems, two FQHCs, which um, receive federal funding in, to provide um, health, primary care health services to people who are under or uninsured. And then one of the sites was um, a community-based organization. So each site identified somebody um, at their site to be the outreach champion. They would log into our HIE, see the list, and give patients a call after they had been to the ER and say, hey, just checking on you, saw you were in the ER. Do you need any assistance getting over to prenatal care? Again, they had access to that patient cost budget. So they were able to also provide assistance with transportation, um, baby supplies, food, uh, anything that would be a barrier for that person getting to that first point or being able to prioritize um, getting into prenatal care. Um, all of our sites then documented back into our HIE, which allowed us to um, track uh, how things were doing and what was happening on those uh, how, on those calls. So that was um, just to give you kind of a snapshot of what we did. We ran this pilot from about August of 2021 until 
um, the end of June of 2023. And we are happy that, uh, we, we were excited that it went well. We um, found that on our calls, people were quite open to being uh, receiving the call. And even if they didn't need support, they were often quite grateful just to be checked on and to have somebody that, you know, said, hey, do you need anything? Um, and or e even just to answer some questions. And so we are excited about how the pilot went. And then now um, our sustainability um, portion of the work. So we're not actively running that workflow ourselves right now, but we're really excited that one of the partners, the community-based partner, which is um, South Jersey Perinatal Cooperative, who provides um, coordinated services for pregnant and parenting people in this area, in this county, um, took over the workflow. And so we've been continuing to, the sustainability um, grant has helped us to be able to continue to support them as they transition. Uh, the workflow into their daily routine. And um, we also have one other organization that's going to start taking on the workflow, hopefully as soon as March. Uh, and we'll uh, be reaching other county patients in other counties that have recently been in the ER. And um, sustainability eventually, hopefully will look like that being settled into those organizations and also um, uh, all the lessons we're learning about getting it trans transferred will help us to hopefully eventually scale it around the state and, and the region. Um, another piece of our sustainability plan is to conduct a rigorous mixed methods evaluation to gain evidence needed to determine if the workflow positively impacted uh, maternal health outcomes. And we feel strongly that if if the data, if that evaluation shows that this was impactful, that hopefully that will help us um, secure the funding we would need to do the scaling efforts. I just highlighted uh, the sustainability domains that most aligned with this project. So um, we think that continuous quality improvement and evaluation uh, is one of the ways we're hoping that um, because this early pregnancy period, so most of the people that we uh, uh, contacted in this pilot were in very early pregnancy, sometimes really around like that six week mark, very, very early in pregnancy. And there's, there's not a lot out there as far as evidence of like understanding this population, what do they want, what do they need? Um, and so we're hoping to contribute um, something to that body of, of evidence about this population. Um, additionally, um, uh, the other domain is to activate and, uh, and communicate partnerships and relationships with collabor collaborators across the community. Um, we've engaged a lot of partners in this project, six partners, and um, we really are grateful for their uh, commitment to, to this project. And also um, just it's been fun to see how much it's changed their relationships with each other. And then lastly, um, stable funding streams and financial resources is another part of our the sustainability domains we're working on um, with those scaling efforts and also funding our evaluation. So with the grant project um, for the sustainability grant project, we have focused on um, preparing for that evaluation, as I was mentioning. So one of the things about this project is that, again, we were working with people very early in pregnancy. And so now we had to wait eight, seven, eight uh, months in a, in a lot of cases until the, the end of the pregnancy for those that continued the pregnancy. And so we have to go back into all those medical records, review and see what happened with the pregnancy, which is a pretty um, time intensive, project to backfill all that data. So uh, we are grateful to have the sustainability grant in order to fund the staff time to do that. And it helps prepare us for that mixed methods evaluation. Um, additionally, that having the ability to we've, uh, continue conversations with partners has helped us get um, not only SNJPC on board with trans the transition of the workflow, but also now we have another um, site uh, uh, that's going to take on the workflow. So. Uh, the continuation of being able to continue to be engaged with the partners and have the time to do that and the uh, ability to strategize has been a wonderful benefit. Additionally, we continue to stay in touch with um, the state, the Office of 
the first lady here in New Jersey has an interest in this program and has uh, we keep them updated. And um, we're hoping again that once we can show some evidence for the program that you know maybe this could be something that becomes the standard of care in the state that everyone who goes into the ER and is pregnant gets a phone call just to help them um, if they need any assistance getting into prenatal care. <clears throat> So far, um, this is uh, just a little snapshot of uh, what how it's going with our sustainability efforts so far. Um, so far, we've backfilled uh, two over two well, almost twenty five hundred um, records um, with pregnancy outcomes. A lot of work went into that, and we're really excited. And that will really help us have a quality data set to do our evaluation. And then additionally, I've, I've already kind of mentioned that just engaging the stakeholders um, has been really beneficial to sustaining the workflow. So the workflow is still living on currently, and we're learning a lot about what how we could support um, more organizations to start the workflow if we get to that scaling um, period. So, um, and then the other thing to mention is that the, um, the two organizations, so it's SNJPC and um, Ascenda, and both of them are connecting and have connecting NJ programs. So these are state funded programs that provide kind of a one stop shop for um, pregnancy and uh, parenting resources and getting people connected into prenatal care. So it's actually, it's going to be folded into the state funding that they get through that connecting NJ program. And then again, continuing to seek funding um, to scale. Um, I think, again, like we're just really hoping, you know, we already feel excited about where we're positioned right now with getting our data set prepared and um, everything we're learning from launching the workflow in those two new sites. And we think it's really positioning us really well for the next stage of our sustainability and scaling, uh, which I'll mention here, which is um, basically in conclusion, Continuing, having the ability, I mean, running the pilot is is kind of, it's a very hard part, but it's also kind of the easy part because we um, have some control over it. The sustainability piece is always our hardest part, and we're very grateful to be able to have this funding to be able to continue these conversations and keep this momentum that we had during the pilot period to keep it going um, so that we can can continue the workflow and and let it live on and let it keep growing and evolving in the in, in as it kind of lives on in these other organizations, um, and it also just helps us keep talking to other stakeholders, um, keep interest alive in the program, and 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 to continue to seek out the funding for further sustainability efforts and scaling. And it, and then lastly, I, I think. We really believe that the pilot um, workflow was impactful. Um, Erica and I even got to do some of the calls and um, just again, can't reiterate enough like how lonely this time is for a lot of people, early pregnancy people. Before they get into prenatal care, a lot of people aren't, they're just not getting a lot of support during that time because a lot. it's hard to identify that people are that early in pregnancy. And also um, there's just a lot of, taboo about talking about pregnancy that earlier because of the high rate of loss and different factors. And so we think that there's a lot of value in really like um, talking to people as early as possible in, in pregnancy to just get them off on the right foot, help them with those first steps of getting into prenatal care that maybe they've never even interacted with the healthcare system. And this is our opportunity to um, welcome them in and uh, start hopefully with a, a good rapport. And so we're hopeful that when we do the evaluation, it will confirm our belief that this is an uh, impactful and valuable workflow to continue. And um, that that will, again, help us secure further funding to maybe make this the standard of care that everyone receives. So I forgot to do a thank you slide, but thank you. And um, uh, yeah, thank you. And um, Erica, if I left anything out, hopefully you'll jump in. Thank you, thank you so much to both teams. Um, sorry, did I cut somebody off? No? Okay. <laughs> thank you so much to both teams for their presentations. I see we had a few questions in the chat. I think I had some questions myself. 
Um, I think I will start with my questions and I'll let some more questions come in through the chat. Um, I think my question for Tyler and Lisa was, you know, with the communications campaign, when you were doing outreach to the community, like, do they have an awareness around doulas? Because I think we're so submerged in the work and we know, you know, exactly the benefits of having a doula and why they're so important and why we're advocating for them. But does your average, you know, typical person who, you know, as Michelle had said, like, is getting prenatal care for the first time, like, really understand the benefits to that? Like, I guess, what is their starting, like, baseline? Yeah, so I, I feel like there is kind of a general understanding about what doulas are, um, just in the sense that right now, it's kind of a hot topic, it's buzzing a little bit. Um, and then just from the conversations that we had with folks in the community, I think people understood what a doula was, but there is still like a need for a little bit more education around what they do. Um, and then I think also what I was finding from those conversations is that their knowledge of doulas came from either them knowing someone who used a doula or they, um, or, you know, in the process of like trying to become pregnant, they were doing a little bit of research and it came up for them. So I guess, um, I guess what I think will be helpful with our campaign is it's something that will just kind of be kind of broadly facing. So you don't necessarily, you won't necessarily need to be looking specifically to find what a doula is. And I think that's the gap that we're trying to fill in. It's like I mentioned before, it's kind of very much so like, word of mouth. I know someone who had a doula or someone told me I need to do this. Um, so yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. I think there was also a question from an audience member about, you know, postpartum doula services, which is actually really interesting because I think, you know, with the different Medicaid reimbursement legislations that are popping up in the States, you don't see as much postpartum care, right? Like they might cover prenatal visits and the labor and delivery, but you don't see as much like postpartum um, visits, like as much as a doula would usually provide. So maybe can you talk to, you know, people who have a community-based doula, like how many touch points do they usually have during postpartum? And then, you know, is it, being covered? How are we advocating for postpartum care? Yeah, I'll chime in here, Jean Janine, and say um, one thing about the education around doulas. I find frequently, not this group, or certainly our co-presenters, but a lot of times people in the doctors don't necessarily know what a doula is. I think nurses are a little more attuned, but sometimes there's education within the clinical provider space that needs to happen about what doulas do and what they don't do as much as in the community, which is we've learned over time. Um, and with the postpartum doula services, this is something that we'd really, for us focusing on that and expanding access to that, I think right now it varies from place to place, but if doula services aren't covered, sometimes people, a birthing person might get one or two maybe three touch points um, after birth, maybe, if the, if it's not covered. Um, and we're do, we've been doing a lot of work on perinatal mental health and, you know, there's new postpartum depression drugs that are coming out. So people are paying more, a little more attention, those who are just outside of, of our professional and sort of passion world, those of us on this call, to the postpartum period and how important that is for the health of the mother and child. And so it would be amazing for us to be able to expand access to support in the postpartum period, particularly for those insured by Medicaid. Um, that's really the focus of what we're hoping to do. Um, and I'll come back to the New Orleans team, but I want to turn to the Camden team a little bit. And I think my personal question is, you know, you briefly describe what an HIE is, the Health Informatics Exchange. Um, 
And it sounds amazing. It's like, why isn't everybody not, you know, sharing their health information with one another and then developing these systems like you do, you know, to guide and navigate patients towards, you know, not just prenatal care, it can use be used for anything. Can you, you know, I think on the back end, like Cameron and I know, you know, how much of an effort it was to even get that clearance and approval. I guess, can you talk to us a bit about the barriers um, and challenges that you faced in, you know, getting access to an HIE, um, what your state is specifically doing um, in regards to that? I'm not the best person to answer that, but, and, and Erica can chime in too. Um, I think, yeah, the HIE is amazing. I mean, as a nurse, when I first started working here, I was like, wow, this is like, it. a lot of people think, like patients think that, oh, well, you can see my record no matter where I go not true. And um, that makes it really hard for um, providers to kind of like know, they're kind of blind in a way if you go to two different health systems. So um, I think there's a lot of challenges and I don't know all the, I don't uh, like nitty gritty of like the technical challenges of it, but certainly there's also, um, you know, I think just seeing it as a priority to have that kind of infrastructure. Um, I think and, and we're hoping that's going to be changing. And I know this year we're going to be focusing on trying to get more um, organizations into the HIE. It's not a perfect tool yet. It's not at the state we want it to be. It still has its limitations, um, but we're grateful to have it. And it honestly, even where it's at now, I mean, um, it's gotten a lot better. And just to be able to do this workflow and monitor in real time. I mean, like every half hour we were getting updates of who was in the ER. So we could literally call people a day, I mean, a day or two after they went to the, uh, they'd been in the ER, which really we think helps a lot. Like our, our successful rate of contact, like actually getting people on the phone, we think has a lot to do with being able to be so quick after the ER. We think we think that people are just more likely to pick up their phone to a number they don't know, a local number they don't know after they've been in the ER because maybe it's related to my care. And then it also gives us, because we're cold calling people, they did not know that we were going to be calling them. So it also just gave them some kind of sympathy and anger, like, why are you calling me? Oh, well, oh, because I was in the ER. Okay. It, it gives, it gives you kind of some way in instead of just like randomly calling someone and not having something to connect it to. Erica, do you want to add that? Erica is the HIE, like she's the expert at using it. I'm not as good as her. So Erica, do you want to add anything? Yeah, we're lucky in New Jersey that the um, regulations allow us to be an opt-out state rather than an opt-in. So for patients, the default is that when they go into a health system, they are opted into the HIE unless they um, specifically request to not be. So that means that we get data from the vast majority of people in our community. One of the barriers we do have is the level of data we get from health systems, and that is more an individual negotiation around confidentiality and data sharing agreements and the, um, you know, the legal and you know, paperwork side of things with each individual health system. And there's a range of ways, you know, people are, you know, range of comfortability that health systems have had with sharing data. So in some cases, we're able to see a lot of data for them. In some cases, it's a little bit more um, basic information, but we are able to see that data for the, you know, the vast number of people. Um, and so from the permission standpoint, like you were saying, it, it the being an opt out state has made it so that we really do get to reach everyone who's going into the ERs. It, it's not a more select group of people because we know that, you know, people who would opt in might be a more specific population, people who are more willing to share information, who have that trust in the health system to share their data more openly is could be a more specific population. So having the opt out policy allows us to really reach truly everyone who's in our community and at need. Thank you for sharing. I think there was one other question. Um, I think in the Q&A, it says, which organization will conduct the mixed methods evaluation? I guess, can you expound on that a little bit about, you know, what you're hoping to use the evaluation for, what you hope um, it will prove? Of course, we want to prove that it's successful, but what evidence are you gathering from it? So we haven't, we, we're just in the beginning stages, so I can't 
say for sure we're still kind of looking at we're still kind of making sure we have we're kind of gathering our data set and um deciding like what to look at but we're, we're going to be working with chop policy lab on um they'll be um doing the evaluation for us and i, I think we've we're still kind of figuring out what exactly we'll look at i think we'll definitely look at birth outcomes um and we're going to also, we have information, uh, you know, we collected a lot of information during the pilot. We're probably going to also supplement that with um, birth certificate data. And so, yes, thank you for clarifying. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is, is what CHOP. I, I forget that this is not just people in New Jersey. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we have a lot of different measures that we can look at. And we're probably going to defer to CHOP on like what, it may, what will make the most sense. We're also going to do some, be gathering some qualitative um, data from people who are involved in like actually like doing the work. Or, uh, we'll be interviewing an administrative champion from each site and a person who was actually doing the outreach from each site to get a better sense of like what they think was meaningful about the pilot. And we also hope to engage some of the patients um, that we worked with on the pilot so it's sort of to be determined exactly what we're going to look at. We're still getting our data sets uh, pulled together. I think one other thing with that, that um, in the qualitative interviews, Michelle talked about wanting to look to at what we learned through the implementation and actually activating the pilot and how that'll help us in standing the workflow up in other places as well. Um, a bit of like the lessons learned and best practices there. Yes, I love when evaluation leads to, you know, um, the quality improvement of a process, right? That's always really important, continuous evaluation and improvement processes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I think there's still a couple of questions for the New Orleans team, but I'm going to quickly launch a poll. Uh, speaking of evaluations, um, us at Anship are continuously evaluating uh, our process and making sure that we're improving, um, you know, on these kinds of experiences such as webinars. So if you wouldn't mind just taking this um, poll for us so that we know how we're doing. Um, and now I will turn it back to Tyler and Lisa. I think there was a question around um, you know, are doulas addressing behavioral health issues, including depression and substance use? Um, doulas do a lot. I, I think it's interesting how, you know, they're asked to do so much um, and there's just not a lot of resources or support for them. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that. I, I, I'm not sure if the question was, do they do that or should they do that? I, I, um, I think it's, I, are they doing that? <laughs> Um, I don't think that the the doula services are um, standardized to include that. But in our context, all of the the conversations we have at a policy level about access to doula services um, and you know reimbursement for that includes it's kind of paired with the work we've been doing on perinatal mental health and how doulas as a support person and an advocate for the, the patient really can see sometimes behavioral challenges or even substance use um, struggles in ways that are uh, very real time, to borrow some of the language that Michelle's using, like this is real time data. And so one of the things that we've been also thinking about, uh, which has informed this campaign, I think in some ways, is what, uh, as in a world where more and more people have access to doulas, what kind of referral system for uh, additional care or meeting additional needs will can, can doulas point their clients to? Um, so I know the doulas that we work with and that we know do do this informally, not because they're required to do it, but because they're sort of on this birth journey with a patient. And there, there isn't an, a built-in mechanism yet for a doula who's a non-medical person to try to point someone to um, you know, mental health services if they need it. It feels like there's another level of infrastructure that, that would have to happen to make that leap, but 
everybody that I know who's in this space is is doing that and you know is trying to help solve everything from insecure housing or maybe IPV issues in the home to you know um, challenges with with um, you know getting to appointments, getting to their prenatal appointments. So that's a long-winded answer, but I think that what you're touching on is really critical. Not long-winded at all. I think it's, you know, very important to point out the nuance between, you know, what a doula is doing and what they can do based on their training and certifications. Um, and also pointing out that there are, you know, these pain points in the system in that even if, you know, a mental health referral was made, it could take several months to get that fulfilled, right? Um, there's a lack of mental health providers, which is why it's kind of falling back on doulas. Um, so I think that there's larger systemic things that need to be considered. Um, speaking of systems, I guess just shifting a little bit though, um, in terms of hospitals and clinics, I think there is a question around, you know, have the local hospitals and clinics been receptive um, and collaborative with you when it comes to the campaign and promoting awareness of doulas? The, I will say that the those that are in sort of our expanded coalition, we we um, lead a New Orleans Maternal and Child Health Coalition, um, which is in the greater New Orleans area, and it includes clinicians and providers and um, real leaders in the health health services space. And so yes, and a goal when we really launch the campaign is to get sign on from institutional partners and clinicians. And so our hope is to, to grow that base of people who support. And we have one, one doctor, for instance, who says, you know, in her perfect world, she's an OBGYN, you know, every, she's an OBGYN and every one of her patients would have a doula and a midwife if they wanted it, you know, but that's not wherever that she's the gold standard. Um, so we're just, we're looking for incremental support to happen and also to build that with nurses because frequently nurses spend a lot more time, um, certainly in the birthing room with um, a person giving birth than the doctor does. So we're working on that. Definitely. Um, I think that those were all the questions, unless Cameron, I missed any. Um, I do want to plug the rest of the webinar series. So if you have questions, put them in the chat because we'll still have a few minutes. Um, so this first session was today's session. Um, we're gonna have another one next week where you will hear from the Southeast Michigan uh, Perinatal Quality Improvement Coalition, which is located in Detroit. Um, and then the collaboration between Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative and Sister Web. Um, they're doing a really unique um, data collection system um, that should enable sustainability for them, but also, you know, more community to find evidence. Um, and then the week following that on February 8th, you'll hear about Sister Web's individual project and Black Women's Blueprint's um, individual project as well. Black Women's Blueprint is located in Brooklyn. Um, they will be talking about separate topics. One will be talking, Sister Web will be talking about development and fundraising. And then Black Women's Blueprint, I'm really excited about, we'll be talking about co-designing initiatives and I think even evaluations with and for families. Um, so please sign up for those if you have not signed up already um, by registering through the same link. Um, share the link with other people who you think would be interested in coming to um, our presentations. We'll try to get the recordings up um, in a bit of a more timely manner this time um, so that you can share those as well. And if you have any questions, you can email you know, me and Cameron um, at AmChip um, about anything regarding the webinar series. Yeah. And I'm seeing some kudos in the chat for the speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, it's always lovely to hear about your work. I know I've heard about it a lot because we work together um, in the community of practice, but it's always so amazing. I'm always great to, I'm always so happy to cheer you on and go like, yeah, I know that, <laughs> you know, they do great work. Um, yeah. So I think I am going to get us a little bit wrapped up today and we will see everybody in the audience, hopefully next week. Um, <laughs> see you all. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.